fantastic to be with everyone today. Um, I'm from the Soil Association Certification, um, and DL Wakefield are one of our clients. We accredit DL Wakefield for the importance of organic greens, um, and it's been great to see that DL Wakefield supporting organic um, agriculture in, in areas which, which you can't even hope to impact um, from here in the UK as an organic um, charity and accreditation body. So, absolutely fantastic to be with you here today. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about, to start, who we are, um, because Soil Association is synonymous with the evolution of the organic movement. A little bit about what, what organic uh, means and an impact on the ground, um, and a top line on what, what's happening in the market at the moment. Because it's um, there's some turbulent times, um, and organic has done some interesting things over the years. So, just some top lines of what's happening in the market um, broadly, but also um, some, a couple of insights on, on, on coffee. So, who, who would sort of say the certification? So, we are an accreditation body, um, we are the leading accreditation body in the UK. Um, apologies, the stats are a little bit out of date, but that's um, just sort of 92 percent um, this year. So we credit 92 percent of all um, organic food and drink manufacturers, brands, producers here in the UK. We're, we're also a standard setter, so um, um, we've been about for seven, uh, for sort of session. Our, our parent company, the charity, has been about for 75 years, and we set the first organic standards in 1967. Uh, so this is before any, long, long before anything was codified. Um, in regulation. So that standards that we set are large applied to, to food, that's a, that's a vast majority of what we do, but it's anything that comes from organic agriculture, so that could be textiles, it could be health and beauty products, anything that comes from an agricultural setting that can be certified to organic standard, can be certified to organic products um, as such. I, I mentioned we are, we are owned by Soil Association of the Charity, um, so Soil Association is fundamentally um, a registered charity, and we are a subsidiary of that, delivering products that support those charitable visions. Those charitable visions are for a sustainable farming system, healthy diets, and sustainable land use. So three, three sort of really broad pillars, um, and so it's a fascinating place to work. I've been a sort of set session for five years. I don't think I'm, uh, there's aspects I haven't even touched on. Um, our recent um, uh, launch of some new carbon schemes, which um, which um, I think hopefully um, Henry and Tom will talk a bit later about carbon in their own, in their own, um, own supply chains um, after cupping. And this is, a, this is a really exciting um, development for, for us in the accreditation world. Environmental accreditation is absolutely booming at the moment, and a lot of that's down to um, carbon accreditations and how we can, how we can um, offset those, um, those, those aspects of our supply chain that we really can't move away from particularly in the food and drink sector, those, those scope three emissions which are really, really difficult to, 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 to change. We're going to need to offset that. What's important is we offset that in a really positive way. So that's a, that's a really, really exciting development for us as, a, as an environmental accreditation body. Um, a, bit, a bit of history on, on, on Soil Association. I said our development as an organisation is synonymous with organic. Well, in 1946, um, you see here our, our luminary thinkers, um, uh, they knew um, Balfour, who was a, um, a handling, handling machine, with her friends um, Albert Howard, um, his sister Mary Langham. They, these are, these are our, our, our pioneers. And they went out uh, around the world in the 20s and the 30s, um, around the world looking at other ways of doing agriculture. So uh, between the wars, we saw huge industrialization of agriculture, right? This is um, um, not for um, any. A big surprise, there was lots of nitrogen kicking around. There some bright German scientists that discovered that by putting nitrogen um, into agricultural systems, I think they grew a lot faster, they grew a lot greener. Um, and this was, this was really was the, the, the acceleration of that industrialization. Now, our founding fathers traveled the world, they, they, thought, they weren't really very happy with this. Really, from a hunch, not many scientific um, understanding. And interestingly, a lot of them traveled and ended up in, in India and in Pakistan. Um, in, in, in these parts of the world where subsistence agriculture uh, was, was still, still, and is still growing today very much the norm. Um, and they discovered, uh, rediscovered, um, ways of doing things at farm level which, which were nature-based and didn't require this industrialization. Um, 75 down, years down the line, we do now start to see that science picking up on these, these initial feelings and thoughts that they, they discovered. So yeah, uh, there, is, there is certainly an intrinsic link between the way we produce our food, our drink, through our farming system, and planetary health and human health. And I'd like to touch a, a little bit on that today. We've got a little video 
um, from um, John Butler, um, who is one of our, uh, one of our first organic farmers, uh, absolutely fascinating chap, and he's going to talk a briefly on, on what it means to him to be organic. And for him it's a little bit different, he, he's, 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 he's a bit before the accreditation process, he's very much at the grassroots level of where organic started. So just a bit of a, 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 a backward thought of uh, how, how he came to organic in the first place. Soil produces food, and without soil, hunger is the consequence. And we damage our soil at our peril. The world brought in mechanization, and then development of chemicals and it was only gradually that people began to see the uh, deterioration of the soil. In dry sunny windy conditions in the springtime particularly the, the fine soil particles on the surface get whipped up into a cloud that can rise into the air three or four hundred feet. There's no soil erosion in good farming. I was brought up with the with the saying, a good farmer leaves the land better than he found it. I never actually like to call myself an organic farmer. I don't know. I like to be considered a good farmer. Good farmer doing things the right way. Um, and in addition to, to some, of, some of our founding brands we certify, we're very much in that vein. I think San Francisco's Brewery, um, Tancaster, just likes to do things the right way, the way his forefathers would have done. So that, that movement, um, so before we get to anything around accreditation, um, the founding pillars of, um, of what the band movement represents, and these, these, these were decided, these are the pillars um, of IFRAM, the International Organization um, for Agricultural Farmers, so excuse me, International Organic Association of Farmers, I vote. Um, health, Ecology, Care and Fairness. Now, most of these pillars are codified now in regulation. These, standards have, these pillars have sort of been, been the background of the organic movement since the 70s, with the exception of the last of fairness. Um, so when I'm talking about accreditation, we're really going to focus on, on the health, ecology, care aspects. Um, health, that there's an intrinsic link between how we produce food, the health of our planet, and indeed the health of us as, as a species. Ecology, that we, um, we focus on nature-based solutions. That's really, really important. And in, in, in the environmental space, we're hearing lots and lots about how technology can solve our, solve our problems. Yeah, maybe technology has a part to play. You know, now we're really focused on the nature-based solutions. That's, that's, that's what's really important. Care, um, that we're not we're farming, not just for today, we're also farming for tomorrow. So that's, you know, it's, it's a, a long-term approach. The government group has been around the for 75 years, um, and it's, it's not fundamentally hasn't changed hugely um, in, those, in, in that period. So it's much a, a long-term approach. Before we talk about organic, we have to think about what is not organic. So what was that industrialization? A, a good way of thinking about um, um, in, intensive agriculture is a, um, a shopping basket where we're bringing in various inputs um, onto the farm. Um, incidentally, organic farming used to be known as closed farming for that, for that very reason. It was a farming system that didn't bring in, didn't buy in its fertilizer, didn't bring in um, its um, um, livestock from outside the farm. Everything that happened within that single farming system. It evolved slightly over the years, so yeah, organic farmers will, will bring things onto the farm, but essentially they're not bringing in um, things that would be foreign to how that farm would have produced it on site in the first place. So, intensive agriculture might be by bringing in um, herbicides, um, herbicides are not with this kind of farming system and selling. Um, the really big one, though, is going to be um, fertilizer. Um, and this is um, fascinating because it's really come to the fore in the last, uh, since February uh, this year with the war in Ukraine. Um, fertilizer is a petrochemical um, um, product that comes from, from natural gas. That's, that's how we make uh, chemical fertilizer. So that is that is the that is the fertility being brought into the farming system, and this is this is really important when it comes to coffee, right? Because over the 19th century, we've seen 
huge expansion and um, early 20th century of coffee um, in, in numerous parts of the world. And that's, that's a huge deforestation. And when we get deforestation, what do we have? We have very, very poor um, soil underneath. And when that, 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 that soil has been completely laid bare for deforestation, we have very poor soil structure, very poor soil health, and therefore we need to bring in lots and lots of fertility in order to continue growing crops. So this, this, is, a, this is a pretty fundamental area for coffee, right? And the other one that's, that, that comes up, that you see a lot in farming systems around the world, um, brand name Roundup, you might be familiar with, is a glass phosphate. Um, so glass phosphate is a, is a herbicide. Um, the picture I've got here is a, 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 a crop sand um, midwest. So this is um, a large scale agriculture, which are counting on, um, on a, single, a single harvest um, at a particular point in time. They, they, they contracted these combines out, and they need, to be, they need to ensure that when they harvest those cereals, the cereals are peak, um, peak dryness, and they're not going to then block when they go to store. So what, what can we do? We can spray glyce phosphate onto our cereals to dry them out instantly, and then when they, when we, the next day when contractors come in, the cereal is absolutely dry, and we, 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 we know we're not having any problems in long-term storage. Glyce phosphate is a, is a weed killer, but we're spraying it onto our, onto our foodstuffs, and recognised past it, by the way. Um, we're spraying it onto our foodstuffs, um, for, for, to, to fit a commercial model that's fundamentally broken. So, yeah, a bit of a, that, that's intensive agriculture, that's what we're that's what we want. So how does organic differ from that? Because it, it's not farming of yesteryear, um, we're not just going back the way doing things, um, working things 100, 100 years ago. Um, we are, we recognise we have to produce food for the growing population. Um, essentially it is this closed loop, I said organic used to be known as closed farming. So we count on, um, on our solar regeneration. So that's that's our fertilizer. Okay, so that's that's um, photosynthesis. That's using the power of the sun to fix nitrogen into the soil by using things like um, ferret varieties of clovers and um, fixed agricultural layers. We also reuse what's what's on the farm. So um, what we produce on the farm, um, they can be composted. Really, really um, important coffee production is coffee pot. So on on coffee, after we have got whole bit coffee, that's really, really high in potassium and, and, um, and nitrogen, um, they're absolutely essential. So um, that, you, using what we have on the farming system is essential for that soil, soil health and fertility. The misnomer here for you guys in the coffee industry is this, is this, this crop picture. Um, crop rotation is a fundamental principle of organic farming. And that, that doesn't necessarily get applied, right, when you're talking about coffee plantations, where you, you're, you're putting down um, a, a, a long-term crop. Um, but, but, but a word of what that means for, um, for the vast majority of organic farmers is about, changing, about moving things around in, in the farm, enhancing biodiversity and reducing the need for pest control. So take the example of a carrot farmer. If you um, grow carrots year on year in the same location, you get carrot fly to quite a significant degree, so then we need to up the amount of pesticides we're using and, and the fungi fungicides we're using because we're, we're, we're not changing the fungal um, makeup of the soil. Um, do that things a little bit differently. Um, with, Growing your crops, so um, that means uh, maybe some intercropping, um, like with agroforestry, um, using different plants in and amongst our perennial plants. So that's um, then also something which we can, we can readily turn, turn in and out. Um, and just a bit of biodiversity, so that we're using pest control in a very, very different way on organic farms. Um, so we might be encouraging high levels of biodiversity. If we're using lots of pesticides on organic farm, we're not going to be seeing the pest, the pest controls that we need. So uh, that's, that's really, really important um, distinction is, is they're really, really diverse places. And a bit on animal um, um, husbandry. Um, we can farm organic in the stock free system. That's, that is doable, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental principle that we are improving soil health. I keep on going back to soil, it's what I call soil association. It's, um, it, it, it's soil health is an absolute paramount to good organic farming. Um, so, uh, livestock, use of livestock in an organic farming system is also really beneficial. I'm not sure whether we see that. So, can we see that coffee plant? Um, we do see another, another bring of like vine, vines. A lot of organic um, vineyards might bring sheep onto the farm or poultry to roam um, out, out, outside of the when, when the grapes are in the on. Um, so, that's again building fertility by using the livestock system. Not anti vegan, it's very important to reduce amount of meat, but livestock have an important part to play in. Um, in rejuvenating and regenerating um, our farming system. There's the principles, but it's, I said it's, it's also a codified um, standard. So, 
this is not unique to the UK. Um, organic regulation exists in part in places all around the world. Um, a, lot, a lot of the jurisdictions around the world would look to the EU as being the largest organic market uh, worldwide or to the uh, American program. But essentially, to market the product here in the UK, any reference to um, as organic products or reference to the farming system is codified in law. Um, so, in order to, uh, to be able to market a product as organic, you need to be certified to do so. Uh, that's what we do as an accreditation body. Um, so we, we deliver accreditation and verification to the UK and uh, the sort of social organic standard. Um, and what does that mean? It means an annual audit, it means a lot of paperwork. Um, what, what I want to come on to next is, um, is a bit about um, why you want to do that. Why you're going to go through the bureaucratic process and certify um, your product to a sort of organic standard. Because it's particularly in, in the current climate, the environmental agenda is really, really is gearing up to be well aware. Um, and organic is a great way of doing that because it's a codified system in law. Um, a lot of businesses <coughs> use a system such as organic to, to avoid any greenwashing um, because they, they can reference back to a set of standards and um, standards have been about improving to work. So, three key areas. I'm going to start with a really difficult one first. Um, it's, it's an area we can't actually, there's not a lot we can really say. Organic is healthy and better for me. Well, I drink a lot of organic wine, that's not necessarily good for my health. Um, I recently found an um, organic Pringle, which is fantastic. Um, it, it's really not good for it's not, it's not good for us at all. I mean, you can, like a regular Pringle, you get them very quickly. So, organic is healthy. No, it's, no, it's not. You're healthy depending on what you put into your body. There are aspects of health that we can, we can look back to an uh, organic farming system um, and say, yeah, that's, that's a different way of doing things. We can say that organic is nutritionally different. Um, so, um, for, for two, for example, to two main areas. Um, firstly, um, in uh, livestock farming, um, the, we can see high levels, about 40% high levels of omega-3 fatty acids in organic milk. Uh, that's similar with, um, with meat, we see different levels of polyunsaturated fats, which are recognised to be a good thing. Um, and that comes back to the, to the organic standards, in so much as um, organic livestock have to have a minimum of 60% pasture fed diet, so all organic. Livestock is grass fed, and that really changes the composition of the fat content of meat, um, and um, not instead not fat content in, in the milk, um, but it does mean we've got different levels of CLAs and omega uh, three fatty acids, which are beneficial. So organic is nutritionally different. Doesn't necessarily mean to say it's healthy, but we've also touched on some of the um, toxins we might be finding um, in our food stuff. So organic food doesn't have any chemical pesticides, it doesn't have any chemical fungicides, it doesn't have any herbicides, no herbicides in organic. Agricultural so These products may be recognised as food safe and suitable for use in agricultural use, but often they're going to come with a safety warning on that as well. And they are rarely tested, so we have a, um, a, a wide uh, umbrella group called Pesticide Action Network, which tries to, uh, to campaign on this, this idea that pesticides are actually only tested in isolation. What we don't test for is the cocktail effect of multiple pesticides working together and what that can mean for human health. So um, that's, it's, it's a very difficult one to, 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 to quantify in any way because let's face it, no one's born, no one's born eating a pure organic diet um, and there are so many other influences um, on our life every time you go out to dinner um, you, can't, you can't be saying to wait I'm sorry, I'm only eating organic, I'm so sorry it doesn't, it's, not really, it's not really practical so um, we can't really be very confident about um, health and organic however, it is one of the single biggest drivers for consumers when, they want, when they're looking for organic food and drink that they want to make a choice to sit they, they seem to be healthy for them, but um, that's, that's their own prerogative. Higher welfare outcomes, which I'll, I'll, I'll glance over because it's not so relevant to us as a, as a coffee sector, um, but it's, um, essentially welfare is a very, very important part um, to organic standards. Um, we have very slight different types of breeds that we use organic farms. So, we have, for example, the poultry sector, um, poultry breeds always have to be slow growing breeds. Um, the, 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 the kill point for, for a hen. Um, is um, 12 weeks against 4 weeks for conventional to organic. Um, so if you have a fast growing breed on an organic poultry farm, they're going to collapse under their own weight by the time they get to, um, to kill date. So um, some small differences there. Um, all organic is always free range, um, so access to, to the open air really, really important. And I mentioned already that organic um, livestock um, has to be grass fed, so a minimum of 60% of pasture fed diet. Um, there is a bit of an overlap for yourselves in the coffee sector. Um, a lot of baristas love using organic milk. Um, I think the jury's in the mouth. 
to be honest. Um, there are other, other milks we can use, we plant, plant based milks, um, which might be modified slightly to make a great barista um, solution. But historically, there are a lot of baristas which have come out there, teamed up with organic farms, increased the amount of pasture um, um, for, for the cattle, and have found that they, they get a better throw, foam, a longer lasting foam um, from organic farms they partner with. But um, yeah, um, yeah, there's a bit of overlap there. Health and animal welfare are the two have always been historically the biggest drivers for consumers, but happily the one that's really emerging um, is consumers want to choose organic because it's better for the planet and better for nature. And it, the great thing is these are the areas we can, we're slightly more confident in how we, how we talk about both this organic. So organic is typically it's a mixed farming system, um, so that means we, we're not using producing large monocrops. What we're looking for is something slightly over the top of the tree. Um, it's not to mean to say we can't do organic on a large scale. Um, yes, a lot of organic farmers, particularly in the global south, um, are, are small scale producers. I think Honduras is like 92% of all farmers are recognised as being um, smallholders. Um, but it does mean to say that we, we in our organic farm, we need to segment it quite differently. So um, if, if they are large scale producers, they're going to be doing some sort of intercropping. So maybe planting, planting, planting. Um, in coffee, that's really relevant. A lot of them, um, High proportion of organic coffee growers will, will be shade grown, they'll be growing from some sort of forestry component um, to what they're doing. What, what, what's that? Again, because we need to protect soil health. We can't bring those inputs onto the farm, so we need to do something to protect the soil health um, and, and increase, increase fertility. Organic farms have around 75% of all our bees, which I think is um, um, a, big, a, big, a big shout. Uh, Pollination is a really big issue. Well, without pollinators, we'll, we would be hungry without pollinators. Just frankly, we wouldn't have uh, anything left to eat. Um, and you know, that, that, that idea of a, um, of a diverse uh, system um, that promotes good health, um, biodiversity leads to uh, better soil health, our fertility, I think we go back to the fertility issue, apologies for repetition, it's a really fundamental part of what we're doing. Um, but 30% percent high levels of biodiversity on organic farms as well. And better for the planet. Um, and this is, this is this is really hot, hot cookie, right? So organic soil is supposed to three and a half tons of carbon per hectare, more than conventional farms. It's macro data, right? So there's, there's going to be winners and losers, some are going to be just more so than others. Essentially what it comes down to is high levels of, um, of, of, of humus acid on organic farms. And there's about three and a half percent on average high levels of, of humus acid on organic farms to conventional. And that enables organic farms to sequester more, 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 more carbon in the soil. And carbon's Carbon sits really well in soil. It's always a great subject for, 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 for store, locking, locking up carbon long term. That's why I come back to this concept of nature based solutions. Um, yes, we can, we can take carbon out of that atmosphere in other, other ways, but the long, the long term way of getting rid of it is to tie it up the carbon in, in, in the soil. I think that's what, that's what coal is, is tied up carbon for the long term. Also, um, great, once we've built up soil health, we can also. Um, um, store water um, through, through, through our soil systems. Um, that's, that's really important in on large scale um, agricultural systems. Um, poor soil health, inability to store water, don't really the times when we do have rain, um, we're going to see big problems in terms of soil erosion. Um, soil erosion, what does that mean? Less fertility. Less problem. Benefits organic, what, what's, what's the, what's the, the trade-off? Okay, so we have these more expensive. Um, I, I'm not going to argue this one hugely um, because I can, there's lots of examples like the gut supermarket can find organic and a, and a conventional product, organic is going to be more expensive. It's, it's not a dictum. Um, I can cherry pick and I can find examples of where organic is not more expensive. Happy coffee is often one of those areas. Uh, but typically, it, it's not it, it's, it's about how we do things organic. So we, we work with nature. So, for example, um, weed control. It doesn't have to be something for purpose it has to be labour intensive. So what's the trade-off there? So what is organic doing that's, that's making it more expensive? We're using a lot more labour on farms. We're actually supporting um, employment. So in, in, in space in that world where we, where we are seeing um, loss of income through, through industrialised agriculture, organic agriculture is a one way to step back that and saying, actually no, we, we need to support uh, agricultural movement and, and understanding of jobs in the agricultural sector. So, um, that's, that, that's one of the trade-offs. Conversion takes two years. Well, actually, in the coffee sector, it takes three years if you're not planting fresh trees. 
sometimes because you, you've, got a, you've got a crop in, um, in situ already. So it takes an additional year's conversion. So three years from taking out those, those inputs on your farm before you can start marketing your product as organic. So there's a, there's a really big impact on, um, on the cost of organic. Um, crop rotations um, doesn't make much money, particularly if we've got um, set aside areas, which are really relevant in coffee plantations where we plant some intercropping. Um, of other crops uh, amongst, amongst coffee trees, um, or some, um, some, um, some agroforestry happening, those which may not be plant, um, uh, plants that are bringing any, any revenue. So that's, that's an off, an also we have to make if we're reducing the amount of total available agricultural land, um, that, that, can, that can have an impact on, on the cost. I'll skip down as one, not so relevant to us. But cost, the cost of food, incidentally, food has never been cheaper um, Present, present circumstances, it, 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 there are a few exceptions around that, but we, we, we live in a world where we pay less and less and less for the food by percentage of our income. Um, organic does things quite differently. We don't see any of these externalities um, in, in organic agriculture, so we're not seeing the same levels of pollution for our waterways, we're not seeing the same um, health, health impacts um, from organic agriculture. So um, we, those, those costs are tied up. Um, we're going to just tend to wash your space quite well as a, as a separate of some margin. That's why organic um, is, a, is, a, is a rationale why and, and what you might think about sort of when you're looking to market products as organic. What's, dri that's, what's driving the growth? Um, a little bit of what's happening because it's not, it's not all, um, it's not rosy at the moment, let's, let's face it. The organic market has done really, really well historically, now worth just over 3 billion, billion here in the UK. Um, these are purely, um, uh, that's larger than Nielsen data, so that's, that's the 65% of our total market um, in um, uh, for organic sector happens in retail. Um, and that's, that's, that's a fairly consistent trend, you see that, that growth uh, over the last 10 years. Um, I'll temper that, because this is, 20, this is our last data set, which is the whole of 2021. The last quarter we sat, we had a bit of a downturn. So whilst the wider food drink market has been in decline since February this year, we're going to caught up with that. So we started to see our first negative growth in this last quarter. Um, it's a little bit early days to say whether we're seeing wider food drink decline, because the reality is 2021, and as you can see from this graph, 2020 were absolutely bumpy years uh, with really, really strong growth. So we're probably seeing a little bit of lapping, we could say. We will we'll really know where we're up to um, in, in the last quarter of this financial year. Um, but the, the likelihood is we're probably going to see negative growth along with the rest of, rest of the economy. We're not, we're not immune to, um, to, 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 to the wider economic outlook. That's the breakdown of waste here. Um, the bit that comes really underrepresented, which is um, where, which a lot of you may, may fall into, is the food service area. And why, why is that? Well, I spoke about regulation of organic. Regulation covers the farming system, it covers the um, transportation and manufacturing and um, trading, the B2B trading of products, with the exception of sales and food service. So I, I will temper that figure um, to 78 million. There's a lot more out there in food service we're just not aware of. Um, so, um, but it's, it still seems to be quite a quite a point area, um, and it's, it's, an area, it's an area, which I'll, I'll show you in a minute, it's an area that's quite strong for coffee as well. And some top lines from the, the last um, quarter's data. Um, I, I, I pulled out a few, a, few, a few categories of interest. Baby food is our strongest area in organic. Um, we, we love looking after our little ones. Um, we have 60% market penetration overall for, um, for organic. And any ideas what overall market penetration might be for organic? For across the whole food drink center? 60% for baby food. 1.8%. So we're still, we're, we are really, really niche, we don't have <coughs> some of those economies of scale. But um, yeah, baby food is still doing absolutely great, going all guns. Dairy is another, another good one, 8% market penetration, still seeing a little bit of growth. Um, a lot of that comes from the milk, the milk sector. Coffee, standout area, congratulations. Um, coffee's been a long term trend. Um, you know, I'll, I'll show you some, some, of, some of the brands you'll be familiar with, a lot of you will be using organic coffee beans yourself. Um, we're not. There's big tea drinkers as we think, are we? Um, but coffee's doing really, really well. A bit of a, in, in, in that, that is largely organic, um, hold, holding the sector up. The, the coffee retail is doing overall doing quite well. That's been slightly uplifted by the organic sector. And as you can see, coffee sales um, 
um, that's, the, that's the 52 weeks data for the last, last 12 months. But the last um, four weeks of um, this quarter, um, coffee sales are up 14.2% organic and still trying to deliver conventional sales. So you're well done, congratulations. Um, wine's the real bigger organic, really big growth area. Uh, I, I pour that out because it's not similar to what you guys are doing in coffee. Um, it's just, it's, it's, there's a strong rooted link in, um, in wine circles um, of terroir. We, we look after the soil, we produce good grapes. And this is not just similar, I think, for coffee. Um, you know, coffee, we've got a, we've got a sector um, that has one of, the, one of the highest levels of chemical inputs of any agricultural sector in the world. Um, and this is, this is it's a very, we can see a plantation is a very different way of producing. Um, so that, that link between looking after the soil and producing a very different type of bean, um, I think it's one that has, has similar outputs to the wine sector, which has firmly established that link uh, over many years. Um, quality is not something we can easily talk about for organic, because as you can see, it's not all about quality. Um, quality is something that a lot of you guys are going to deliver to the product. Um, but it's that understanding that if we're starting, if we're, if we're, if we're starting with a really good bean, um, we can perhaps do something slightly different with it to say, uh, um, uh, poorly produced products. Um, th those are just a bit of an idea, those, those brands are out there, which many of you will be familiar with, who are really driving um, organic coffee sales. We've done it incidentally, um, um, it's about 50% um, milk and coffee, um, the, the biggest purchaser of the food service for, for organic. Um, that goes beyond Pret. Um, Pret I have seen also recently launched um, retail ranges, as have um, um, Plant Organic recently launched retail range range with, uh, with Waitrose, as have Leon. So uh, this, these are the things that are really driving, driving growth in the sector. That's me in a nutshell. A brief overview.